Okay, hello YouTube. Um, today we're going to be taking a look at uh, probably what will go down in history as like uh, the most critical game in this match, and it will probably uh, go down in history for a couple other things too. For one thing, it is the longest game ever played um, in a World Championship match. Uh, this was Magnus Carlsen going full on Karpov on Ian Nepomniche. And um, anyways, uh, if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, uh, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. Let's go ahead and dive right in. So in this game, Magnus Carlsen had the white pieces and he opens up with d4. Um, Magnus Carlsen is basically uh, being a switch hitter in this match. He's willing to play both e4 and d4. And actually, Magnus Carlsen is willing to play really just about anything. Um, and he prefers uh, to play the sidelines of most openings as opposed to the main lines, trying to get positions into territory um, where he can just kind of play chess. And what that means is, and this is, I think, a big misconception of Magnus, is he wants to get people into his preparation as opposed to having them play their preparation. And he does have quite a bit of his own preparation. He's got a whole team working for him um, on a lot of these sidelines, but he's perfectly content with an equal position and something that his opponent will have just pose his opponents a few problems. And then um, if his opponent makes any mistakes, he knows that he's a good enough player that he can capitalize on all of those mistakes because he is the number one player in the world and he is very good at, at finding all of the right moves. So the game continued. It was d4, knight f6. We have knight f3, d5. We have g3, e6, bishop g2, bishop e7. We have castles, castles. And this is basically a Catalan. And then Magnus plays b3. So this is by far and away not uh, the normal move. And actually, Magnus Carlsen tried in a previous game. He tried the move pawn to c4 um, in another Catalan. And the pawn to played the open Catalan. And... Um, that game, on a theoretical level, actually went really well for Nepomniche. Nepomniche, even though he had to play Magnus's pet idea, uh, you know, Magnus got his way in the opening, as he, as always. He got his way in the opening when he played uh, the Catalan. He managed to play a sideline that he was familiar with, but Nepomniche responded very well and probably actually had an advantage in that game. Um, if you look at my uh, comments on that game, I, I thought that Nepomniche played the opening spectacularly well, and the majority of the game was probably slight edge black. So Magnus goes for an even quieter line. He plays b3, not breaking in the middle at all. And Nepomniche responds really well. If white's not going to challenge the center, we go ahead and challenge the center. And that's just the way we should be replying to this. We should be challenging the center. Black's big challenge in the Catalan is usually just finishing the development of his queenside pieces. He basically wants to finish the development of his queenside pieces. And one of the things that Black needs to do to kind of facilitate that is eventually he needs to create some sort of tension in the middle and open up a rook file. And if you create this tension here, it means that eventually this rook will be able to come to c8. And for the most part, once you play a move like c5 and there's no other tension in the structure, uh, the writing is on the wall, so to speak, for Black solving his opening problems. So takes bishop c5, and then Carlsen uh, does strike in the middle. He plays c4, but it's just coming kind of a, maybe a move too late. So again, Nepomniche responds correctly. He takes that pawn. We have to take it. We can't end up with an isolated queen pawn in a position where our pieces are poorly coordinated. So now Magnus plays a, a really interesting move. He plays queen c2. And I guess the, the main idea is um, eventually he, well, it looks at, on the surface, it looks like the main idea is just to play queen capture c4. And uh, right now, uh, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of alternatives for black because this pawn is pinned to the bishop. We have this pin here, so black is going to have to make a defensive move. But the defensive move that black has to make is a move he wants to make anyway. Um, moving this queen to e7 is a great place to tuck the queen away. The queen actually likes being on the e7 square. It's out of the way of the open file. It allows rooks to transfer to d8 and c8, which is the eventual location that everything wants to go. At this point, it's really clear how Ian is going to finish his development with moves like, you know, knight c6, and then simply, you know, either just getting the bishop out of the way with something like bishop d7, and then say rook d8, bishop e8, or uh, just pushing this pawn at some point and developing with bishop b7. So he's got a real clear roadmap to how he's going to fix his position. And then Magnus again throws another curveball here. He plays knight on b to d2. 
and just offers up an extra pawn, just says, hey, Napoleon Shade, you want to be up an extra pawn? Now, of course, the danger of taking this kind of pawn is anytime you're in the Catalan, you always have to start worrying about whether or not you're ever going to get these pieces off of the ground. That's always the priority. And that's the scary thing with these pawn sacks in the Catalan where white has a lot of pressure along this diagonal is you really start getting nervous about how we're going to unwind our queen side. So it's understandable that Napomniche didn't want to accept this gambit. It's an um, interesting question on whether or not he could have. So he could have played C captures B3, and then we would have had maybe something like Knight B3. Again, just gaining this tempo to keep up all this pressure. We could have had something like Bishop D6 and then Knight F to D2, putting all of this pressure on the queen side and making it very difficult to develop. And then we could play something like knight c6, and let's say knight to c4. And, okay, I mean, black has an extra pawn, but again, it, it's really not clear how black is supposed to finish his development in a fluid way without material hanging at this point. White has a lot of play. He's got that open diagonal. It's not clear how black unwinds his queen side. So I think it's really reasonable um, that Napomniche avoided this um, and just after knight on b to d2 just continued with his development, just played knight c6, said, look, I just want to win this race. I want to get these pieces out. This is totally legitimate. So we have knight to c4, and then we have b5. This is uh, really clever because if he can get away with it, he would like to develop his bishop to the long diagonal. Um, we have knight on c to e5, and then we have knight b4, gaining this tempo, this very nice tempo, um, against the queen and making it possible to follow up with the move bishop b7. Um, other moves just didn't work tactically. So we have bishop b4, queen b2, and then we have bishop to b7. And Napomniche looks like he's gotten out of the opening in real good shape. It, it just looks like he's totally, um, totally equalized here, and it looks completely even to me. We have a completely symmetrical pawn structure. Absolutely nothing's going on. Um, these bishops are now equivalent. Uh, each side has a bishop on the long diagonal, and also if, if black manages to exchange this dark squared bishop for the light squared bishop, I would dare say uh, white's king is a little bit looser and a little bit more airy than black's king in that case. So I like I like black, but I mean, objectively, the position is just completely level. There, there's just nothing going on here. Um, you know, people are usually in these types of positions, white finishes development, everybody shuffles rooks to the open files, a few exchanges happen, and then hands are, you know, hands are extended and draws are agreed. So the game continues a3, knight back to c6, uh, knight to d3, Magnus is doing what he has to do, he's retreating the knight to try to keep things alive in the position. If he just starts exchanging, um, you know, like I said, hands are going to be extended, draws are going to be agreed. So we're going to be uh, going knight d3, and then Napomniche plays bishop b6, and like I said, I love Napomniche's position here a little bit more than Magnus's. Um, he's got these two very beautiful bishops, and I just like them. Uh, so I think, you know, like, but again, the position is completely level, uh, bishop g5. Um, but of course, the one upside of this position is it's probably, we can be, we can rest assured that everybody has left their opening preparation at this stage in the game. It's highly unlikely that either side had this position sitting on their computer at home. So in that respect, again, we have a situation, which has just been repeated throughout this match so far, where Carlson got his way, he got a position where it, it's, it hasn't been seen a whole lot, and it's about an equal position, and it's a chess game, but Napomniche um, got the better of it you know, out of the opening. It, it seems like he had enough preparation to get to a position where black is at least totally equal, if not very, very slightly better for black. Um, uh, it, it's it's quite possible that black has a very, very slight edge here. So then we have rook fd8, just getting the rook to the open file. Uh, we have uh, bishop to f6. I mean, just to give you an idea of how dangerous things are already getting, if white just continues with something natural looking, like, if we play rook a to c1, black could probably just play knight to d4. And um, these exchanges are looking like they're going to be favoring uh, black pretty heavily. So this is looking pretty good. You know, if, for example, knight d4, we could play bishop d4, gaining a tempo against the queen. And after the queen moves, we could exchange off the light squared bishops. And 
this is super uncomfortable uh, for for white. Um, black would probably be clearly better here. Um, this is looking really good. So instead, um, you know, Magnus felt like he had to play bishop f6, and he probably does. And then we have um, g takes f6 from Nepo. So why not queen f6? Because at this point, Nepomniche is probably playing for a win. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the honest truth, is Nepomniche just has the same opinion I have at this point. He feels like his position is slightly better. And he feels like he should be the one playing for a win. He feels like eventually white's going to end up with the loose king side. He sees the idea with knight d4. He's currently the one with a bishop pair. Um, black has every right to start trying to press in this position. Um, so gf6, avoiding the queen exchange and avoiding those hands shooting across the board with a draw, is a really reasonable decision. So we have rook ac1 and then knight d4. So he's going for it. This is the idea. We have knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, gaining that tempo against the queen. Queen a2, bishop g2, queen g2, king g2, queen b7. So now black has the bishop versus the knight. Um, the bishop is significantly better than this knight. This knight can't go to any kind of forward moving squares. And black has taken uh, both diagonals on the board that are worth anything. He's taken the light square diagonal and the dark square diagonal. And this king is really airy. There's a lot of holes around this king. So, so far, big success story for Nepomniche. Um, coming out on top in this opening, probably this is now slight edge black. So we have king g1, queen e4. Gorgeous move. Definitely advantage black now. Uh, queen c2. a5, just gaining space. Rook fd1, king g7, nice and solid. Nothing wrong with king g7. So we have rook d2. And then we have maybe just like a super interesting moment in the match. Um, it's a question of like how to proceed for black. And I'm not really sure. Like I do like black's position and I feel like black can just continue to improve maybe with natural moves. Maybe we play something like um, F5, for example. Like, maybe we just shoot this pawn out to f5 and just continue to make small improvements in the position. Nepomniche went for something else. He went for a huge imbalance in the position. He played the move rook a c8. And it doesn't leave white much of a choice. White needs to exchange the queen for two rooks. Now, most of you may or may not realize this, but it that's, for the most part, that seems to be an equivalent exchange. Like, if you... Um, watch my video on what are the relative value of the pieces. I point out that a lot of the piece values that were taught as kids, like the rook is worth five, the queen is worth nine, the knight is worth three, the bishop is worth three, the pawn is worth one. A lot of these piece values are somewhat incorrect. Like these are rough piece values. And for one thing, the queen is a, a little bit undervalued and the rook is a little, a, a little undervalued at nine and, and the rooks are a little overvalued at five. So, the queen for two rooks is basically an even trade under most conditions. Now, the upside of having the queen, especially when you have a bishop to coordinate with, is the rooks really have to stay together. So you have to coordinate those two rooks and keep them together pretty much at all times. Otherwise, that queen can pick off one of those rooks very easily. So usually the side that has the queen actually has a much easier task. It's actually a much easier position to play. But oftentimes these positions, as long as both players play competently and there's no other mitigating factors in the position, like big weaknesses or kings that are super, super loose or anything like that, a lot of times these positions will just end in draws where neither side can really make progress. But Carlson does. He exchanges the queen for the two rooks. And then we have uh, queen to d5. Nepomniche immediately starts poking at um, white's pawns and uh, making it, you know, Carlson is going to have to find some seriously good defensive moves here um, to deal with this queen and this bishop poking at this already loose king. So then we have b4, we have a4, you know, gaining some more space. We have e3, we have bishop back to e5, just maintaining things. We have h4, uh, we have h5, preventing that pawn from going forward. We have king h2, and here at some point it, it just shows that, you know, Magnus is just willing to hang back and just say, look, I don't think you can make progress here, even though it feels super scary to play the white pieces because both of these rooks are still separated and it feels like they could be picked off. 
There is nothing specific here that Black can do to actually pick off either one of those rooks or to make any inroads into White's position. So on the whole, this should be a completely equal position where nothing can really happen. So Black tries uh, Bishop to b2, and it's a somewhat tricky move, like if Rook b2, Queen here, it's nearly impossible to, to coordinate to defend everything. Uh, but White responds instead with Rook c5, we have Queen d6, and then we have uh, Rook d1. So again, just a couple of, a pair of perfect moves from Magnus, and um, he's threatening now to play knight takes b2, so uh, Nepomniche responds, he grabs this pawn on a3, uh, Magnus gets a pawn as well. He plays rook takes b5, queen d7, rook back to c5, and then we have a uh, pawn to e5 from Nepomniche. And um, it's kind of interesting, because uh, Napomniche could have uh, grabbed the pawn. Like, he could have played bishop takes b4, and then after rook on c to c1, we would have bishop a5, uh, knight f4, and then queen b5. And this is looking pretty good for black. Like, it looks like, you know, this passed pawn is really dangerous. So the question is... Like, is there anything wrong with it? Well, I guess White could have tried rook b1, queen f5, and maybe rook b7. And maybe this is scary, because maybe there's something going on here on the f7 square. Maybe White is going to be doubling up with, say, rook d7 and threatening mates along here. Um, it, it's it's definitely something that you could have been scared about, but at this, but Black, um, looks like Black would have been doing just fine after e5, knight h3, Queen e6 to just hold that all together, rook a7, and then simply queen b3, hitting that rook and threatening to advance the spawn. Uh, and also, just just keeping in mind, this queen is now holding the f7 pawn. This actually looks like major advantage black. So he could have taken this pawn, he could have kept it, and um, yeah, the a pawn's super dangerous, and probably Nepomniche has every chance of going on to win from here. So instead of that, he played e5, and a lot of this was just he was getting into time pressure. He had five moves left to make the time control. So he plays pawn to e5, um, and then uh, we have uh, rook to c2, and now it's, uh, uh, we'll just, queen d5 centralizing the queen. This makes sense. So, I mean, again, it's a question of, like, can you take on b4? I don't know. He didn't take last move, so... Okay, so he didn't take this move. So queen d5, and then you have rook on d to d2, so now the pawn is uncapturable. We can't play bishop takes b4. So then we have queen b3, uh, we have rook a2, and then we have a pawn to e4. Um, it's an interesting... Uh, well, I mean, let's get real. It's not that interesting. It, it's probably just a mistake. So, I mean... We could have played uh, maybe just uh, bishop takes uh, b4, like maybe this is possible, but it seems like black doesn't have quite enough here to keep playing for a win. Like if rook b2 and we exchange, then it's just a queen for the two rooks, but we're not uh, we're not keeping that a pawn. So if we don't keep the a pawn, this is just going to be a draw. We can shake hands and go home. So we need to keep that a pawn. So it seems like Bishop takes b4 is off the table. It was on the table a few moves ago, but now it's off the table. So it seems like the only alternative would be something like f5. Um, and maybe we can play for a win this way. So like f5, knight c5, and then we play queen b4. And then we'd have something like knight takes a4, queen b3. Followed by maybe f4 for black. And black could be breaking through against the white king. And this could be major advantage black. Although he gives up that a pawn, it doesn't necessarily seem like there's a huge way around that right now. So instead he played e4, we have knight c5, queen takes b4, and then we have knight takes e4. Um, hmm. So knight takes e4, it was move 40 and it was a mistake. Uh, so he had kind of a win here. He could have played rook on c to d2. He could, he could have done this, rook on d to c2 and just held that knight. And it's difficult to find any move for black. Uh, so if, for example, like, let's say f5, we're going to play knight takes a4 here, picking up that pawn. And then say queen takes a4, we're going to play rook c3. And 
uh, white is probably nearly winning here. Uh, the issue is, is at this point, now black's king is a lot airier than white's king. And black doesn't have a good way to get in to attack the white king. Um, white can just hunker down in defense or defensive mode, and that's fine. And then meanwhile, all of white's rooks can go to the 7th rank. And even if we just attack the f7 square and black defends it, and we just rip on f7, we're going to be going into this endgame a pawn up. And that's it's actually a really good pawn. Uh, it's it's a nice solid pawn to the good, and we just can just slowly bring our king around and play for a win. So, yeah, I mean, this was an opportunity missed by Magnus. He could have played for a win here, taking advantage of Napomniche's e4 mistake. But instead of playing this, he played knight takes e4, and this allowed queen b3. Um, we're not going to play queen takes e4, rook a3, uh, with the same idea, basically, of playing the other rook to a2 and then snapping up that pawn. So then rook on c to e2, he keeps the bishop, the knight comes back, queen b5, a little bit more in maneuvering, and then that a pawn becomes super dangerous. Now at this point, I thought, after uh, knight to f4, when I was watching this game, I thought to myself, there is no way Napalm to shake can possibly lose. Um, as long as he holds on to this pawn on a3, nothing bad can possibly happen to Napalm to shake, because the rooks are going to have to constantly babysit this pawn, and this pawn is permanently held with this bishop on f8. So I think, like, this is something that Magnus does. He gets people into these super long maneuvering games, and he wears them out, he tires them out. But this seems really strange to me, because if anybody should be getting tired here, it's Magnus, because Nepomniche at this point with black is playing for two results. He's playing for a win or a draw. At any point here, Nepomniche could just shuffle his queen around Nothing is nothing can be done. I mean, there's a but there is there's a little bit of, of of danger here. So he has to constantly keep an eye out for tactics on h5. But these tactics never seem to work because it always seems like this pawn will just run and make a touchdown if we abandon um, too much material uh, away from its defense. So. It seems like if any, you know, if Magnus had the black pieces, he would win with black. And apparently if Magnus has the white pieces, he's going to win with white. So Magnus wins with both colors here. Uh, that's all I can say. So we have queen a5, we have rook a2, babysitting that pawn. Bishop to b4, we have rook d3. Magnus is just hunkering down, just playing hunker defense, just hunkering down with everything and just shuffling his king back and forth, shuffling his knight around, you know, just doing different stuff. And it doesn't seem like anything's happening here. And then we have um, queen e4, and okay, it allows rook a3. So this is this is weird. Like queen e4 is really weird. If he doesn't play queen e4, that a3 pawn can never get captured. If the a3 pawn can never get captured, nothing bad can ever happen um, to to black. He's fine. So maybe this was like uh, something that Napomniche missed after king to h2. He missed that this uh, move was possible because he thought queen h4 was this super awesome resource. I mean, I don't really know. Um, I don't know what to say here. So, I mean, the whole point after queen e4 um, takes is if we have um, bishop takes a3, let's say rook takes a3, the issue is is that basically after this a pawn is gone, white should be completely winning because he has a totally solid pawn structure, and the h pawn here is going to fall, the f pawn is going to fall. I mean, all of black's pawns are, are unreasonably weak. Now, this is something that Carlson should have been aware of, and like remember what I said before, the rooks are typically overvalued and the queens are typically undervalued. I mean, uh, so, so that's one of the things. It's like a rook really isn't a five-point piece. If we make this exchange for four points. This is a good thing uh, for us, especially considering the weakness of black structure here. Carlson is trying to get into some sort of position where he has a knight and a rook versus a queen, and all of black's pawns are weak. He's trying to get there, especially if his king is relatively safe tucked behind these pawns. So how and why Ian Napomniche should play queen e4, I don't know. The only thing I can point to is just fatigue. And Magnus does this to people. He does this to opponents. He does this to great players. He gets them tired. He plays a la Karpov style. He just plays slow, accurate chess. 
and just gets people exhausted. And he seems to have sort of like this type A personality where he wants to win all the time, but also a type B personality where he's just kind of like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so he's just content with just maintaining a position forever. Okay, so we have rook a3, and I guess Napomniche thought he had queen h4, but exchanging the a-pawn for the h-pawn is a very favorable thing for white. So after king g1, and then we have queen back to e4, white gets to move his rook, and this position is clearly advantage white at this point. So now it's Magnus who's pressing, and it's a question of whether or not Napomniche can hold on. And to be totally honest, against somebody like Magnus, this is a very hard position to hold on to. It's nearly impossible to defend. Now, eventually they got into a position where the table bases had it, and you know, once they got down to seven pieces, and the table bases at first said the position was a draw, but on a human level, it's a nearly impossible draw to achieve, especially against somebody like Magnus that's going to press. And there were a few moves in here that Magnus played that I was very, very impressed by. I think a lot of us would have just said, okay, I have no losing chances as long as I keep my pawns like this, and I can just shuffle my rooks around endlessly and make threats. But at the same time, it's very difficult to make forward progress later if that's what you do and if black defends appropriately. So Magnus, uh, so Napomniche plays bishop e5, which is a good move. Magnus starts redeploying um, some of his pieces. He redeploys his king. And now here he makes this super committal decision to play pawn to f3. And that's why this guy is the world champion. Because everybody watching this game, every single strong player, including myself, said the same thing. They said, why Why aren't we just keeping this king behind these pawns where we know we're safe, we know we can't get checkmated. Why aren't we just keeping this king behind these pawns and then just trying to maneuver our rooks and make something happen? Well, against the best players in the world, sometimes those are easy positions for them to solve because they can just, you know, find a couple of ways to shuffle. And sometimes in a game of chess, you have one opportunity and only one opportunity to shut down your opponent's ability to control a, a square complex or to keep your pawn structure mobile. And once that opportunity goes away, it never comes back. And that's something that Magnus Carlsen is able and willing to recognize. So he plays f3 and gets that mobile pawn structure. And Napomniche plays what everybody was afraid of. He plays queen d1. Basically, now if king f2, which looks logical, this queen is going to sneak behind everything with queen to h1, and it'll be an easy uh, draw for black. Actually, in some cases, black might even be winning. And this is why no strong player wanted to do this. We don't want to change the game from a game with two results to a game with three results. But Magnus, again, just plays this brave move. He plays f4, he makes some progress, makes some air for his king, and he finds a way to keep the king and the knight really close and just keep it from keep the queen from ever having any real checks or any real ways to get in. It's also good to note how he's keeping his pawns on dark squares to prevent this dark squared bishop from having any scope. So this game just keeps going. Bishop b6, rook a1, Magnus is making some more maneuvers, more shuffling, more dangerous threats of things like rook g8 mate, and you know, just making all these scary kind of shots just happen, move after move after move, just poking, prodding, making things happen. Napomniche is doing great. He's finding the defensive resources. He's finding moves like queen h1, but then Magnus is finding the moves that keep stuff alive, that's preventing perpetual checks, preventing black from making progress. Now, eventually, uh, Magnus uh, just continues weaseling around, and he gets... Napomniche into this incredibly difficult position because Napomniche has to find a place for this bishop to go, but at the same time, Napomniche has to be very cautious about allowing uh, black, allowing white to start grabbing pawns, and he has to be very cautious that an exchange sack could sneak in at some point, and then we could have a position like we were afraid of having earlier, where we have a knight and a rook and a couple of pawns versus the king and the queen, and white can start making progress by pushing those pawns. And it's very difficult to avoid all of those things, especially when your bishop doesn't have an anchor. Now, this is something really important to understand. All of white's pieces, the reason that white is so much better here is all of white's pieces can be anchored. The rook can be anchored to pawns. And anchoring is a really important concept. And it's not talked about enough, and it's not taught enough. Uh, but basically, white is anchoring his pieces, so his rook can be anchored, and eventually his knight can be anchored. This bishop, since it's a dark-squared bishop, cannot be anchored. 
So it's a piece that is constantly going to be harassed. And that's basically why black is worse here. And that's basically how black ended up getting into trouble. This piece was not anchored. So after rook here, here, we have rook there. And then we have bishop a7, just a repetition of moves just to see what black wants to do. And then Magnus goes ahead and he grabs that pawn. And then here was his idea. After queen d3, Magnus intends to take advantage of this loose bishop and go into one of these endgames that was talked about previously, where black is basically just suffering and white is playing for two results. He sacrifices on f7. And then after king takes, he picks up that unanchored loose bishop. And once again, now Magnus has the ability to anchor all of his pieces at some point. This rook can anchor. This knight can anchor. He's got plenty of anchor squares. And then he can start slowly pushing his pawns forward. And there is probably a way to draw this for black. But I don't know of any human being that can do it. So I don't blame Napomniche at this point for going on to lose this game, for losing the longest game in the history of the World Championship, for hanging on as long as he did with as many perfect moves as he played, because really, you need to be a computer to save this with black. This is just an impossible position to save, with these pawns slowly advancing up the board, and with Magnus Carlsen, the number one player in the world, playing the white pieces. You just don't want to be on the black side here. So queen here, we have uh, shuffling a slow improvement of pieces with... You know, slow anchoring, uh, Magnus Carlsen taking his time, trying to figure out the exact right formation to put his pieces into. Um, and, you know, just making the game really, really long, making Black have to find all of these tactical moves and all of these tactical threats each and every single move to make sure that he's not losing material. And then eventually kind of stumbling on to the right formation with the knight on e2 and the rook on d4 and deciding to go ahead and advance his pawn. And of course, this resets the 50 move rule and it resets Napomniche's suffering. So, so now he has to suffer some more and find more defensive moves. And keep in mind, it gets harder and harder and harder to defend as these pawns move further and further up the board and this king's oxygen starts getting pinched off. The more progress that he makes, the harder it is for black to defend. But Magnus also has to be careful about how he makes that progress because Napomniche's only chance is to play perfectly accurate chess and then eventually start checking the king from, from behind when the pawns have yielded um, this king a little bit too much air and a little bit too much oxygen so that the king can no longer avoid perpetual. However, it went the other direction. When the pawns went up the board, um, the king's oxygen got cut off and black ended up not being able to defend. So it continued queen h1, and Magnus starts advancing. Uh, Napomniche exchanges off his h-pawns, just trying to make the king a little airier. At this point, the table bases had it, and they were saying that this should be a draw, but it was a nearly impossible draw uh, for any human player to get, and it didn't require that many mistakes for things to go horribly wrong. And basically what happened is after the queen went to the wrong area, you don't want your queen over here in front of your pawns. You need the queen back here behind. And if you don't have the queen behind, then when the knight gets close to the queen, it has a tendency to completely cut off any hope of getting a perpetual check. It, it cuts off the air of the queen while simultaneously cutting off the oxygen of the king. So after knight h5, the position was hopeless. So Napomniche's mistake was, was just kind of like a fundamental mistake of getting his queen in front of these pawns. The king needs to be in front of the pawns, so that's correct. But in this case, you need your queen behind the pawn for that maximum checking distance against the white king in an attempt to, to maintain that draw. But that being said, getting a draw even with the queen behind the pawns is it's difficult. I mean, fundamentally, that's where the queen belongs, but you know, good luck making all of this work in a practical game uh, without falling into some position where you're just completely lost. Uh, so, I mean, it was a good try, but I mean, at this point, it's over. After e6, um, there's too many threats. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's just the immediate threat of moving the king, threatening mate. There's the immediate threat of rook f7 followed by knight f6. Uh, there's too many threats. It, it's over. Uh, you, you can't defend everything. It, it's just over. And e6 was the most accurate way to finish the game. Um, and, you know, Magnus Carlsen is just winning. There's no way to get perpetual with this queen in front. The knight is just controlling everything. So we have queen g6, and worth, I guess worth a shot, and then just 
ridiculously accurate move, uh, avoiding this this last end game that maybe Black could try for. If Queen takes e6, we're going to have Knight to g7 check. King takes, 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 and then just know your king opponent games. King g5 is completely winning. If you don't know why, it's just here, here, and then, you know, when the... This is opposition. So, I mean, very basic ending. When the king gives way, we escort the pawn down the board, and we make a queen. So, he can't take the pawn, and because he can't take the pawn, this this threat, knight f6, is pretty much unstoppable. And I think Napomniachtchi probably just wanted to resign, but at the same time, you don't want to resign um, after such a long game where you had so many chances. So you just play a few more moves and just make your opponent prove it. So I think King d8, we have f5, uh, Queen g1, uh, Knight g7, highly accurate move, um, giving his king a place to hide on g8 to avoid all the checks. And then there's simply no stopping um, e7, e8. And Napomniachtchi saw that and thought there was absolutely no reason to go any further. Um, so he go, we went ahead and he resigned right here, resigning the longest game in World Championship match history. And I think this game, um, it really put Napomniche in a, in a bad spot, I think, psychologically, because to play such a long game where you had to work so hard at the board is so mentally exhausting. And this is something that's always surprised me about Magnus Carlsen. All players seem to suffer from this type of mental exhaustion, this type of decision fatigue. And Carlson seems to be somehow immune from it. I don't know what it is, but he seems to do this to other people, but it doesn't happen to him very often. And, uh, you know, Karpov had the same skill where he was able to, you know, play these long games and these long dis these long uh, games where lots of decisions had to be made, and somehow he never seemed to get decision fatigue. So I think this was a huge victory for Magnus Carlson. Not only was it the first win that he's had in a world championship match uh, since 2016, it's also um, a win in the longest game that's ever been played, and also I think it's a major psychological victory for him over Jan Napomniachtchi. So that was um, Game 6 of the World Championship match between Napomniachtchi and Magnus Carlsen 2021. Magnus Carlsen takes the lead, um, and he does so in a way that leaves um, Napomniachtchi probably exhausted and just not wanting to play chess anymore. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed watching this video. I hope you learned something new about chess. And um, if you like content like this and want to see more of it, uh, please hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. And um, thank you very much for watching.